measure of the good things for everyone. How do we set about getting it? Where do we begin? This is where the economist comes in with his theories and plans. His is not an exact science, but he does need to base his policies on facts. Facts about our growing populations, about the people who live in towns, their birth rates, their death rates, their occupations, how many live together in one room. About the new divisions of labor, workers caught up in the seemingly impersonal processes of industry, becoming units of efficiency measured in tons per hour. About the number of students who are beginning to pour from our universities with their careers still to shape. Can they find security any more than those who live by the land? The farmer's anxieties may be simpler, but no less pressing. He worries about his next harvest, or whether his newborn son will live to inherit his land. So many different ways of life, different ambitions, different needs. The economist doesn't claim to know the answers to all income of a thousand million pounds amongst 40 million people. That leaves only 25 pounds per head per year, a pitiful sum. And our population is growing fast. How can we make our income grow even? Quite simply, we aim to live, create the basis of a modern economy and a modern way of life. The changes that have already come about have why the schoolboy of today can look at the relics of the past as things to wonder at. He lives in a different world now, a world dominated by science and the habits of observing and questioning. Nowadays, we dig into the soil, not only to plant seed, but to find out more about its properties. Some of our soils are rich and fertile, but many are poor. We have to discover soil and how we can improve the less fertile ones. We experiment with new varieties of plants. By crossbreeding, we may get higher yields we find ways of fattening livestock to give us better meat and more protein. We have to explore the hidden riches of our seaboard. We catalog all the species of fish we can find, get to know about their feeding habits and where and how best to catch them. All this is necessary before we can begin to put money 
into developing a large-scale fishing industry. It's much the same with our mineral wealth. The surface of the land is lifted with clues as to what lies beneath. But many of the clues are false ones, leading nowhere. It may take years to find anything at all. It's a search under the discipline of science. The habit of looking systematically for things you never knew were there. It means weighing every bit of evidence in the balance, down to the smallest grain of sand. And the result of all this searching, checking and thing, is that you may find uh, in the web a little gold. Not much, but enough to make a few wedding rings. Just a small look of business. Or in the north, you may find large reserves of tin and columbite. There's always been a good market for these abroad. from eastern Nigeria has for 60 years or so been both a main source of industrial power at home and an export industry. Now the markets are declining and we must try to find other outlets and uses for it. Our mineral wealth has no value unless it can be matched to present day needs. You only look for coal because you need fuel. You look for limestone because you urgently need cement for building and we've been lucky enough to find it in all three regions. There is an element of blind chance as well as careful calculation behind the search for minerals. It's taken 20 years to piece together the evidence of oil beneath the Niger Delta, and the job is far from finished yet. Out of it, we have a growing industry, one of the country's largest. We need oil today because we need extra power and more machines. And more than that, we need the money which the export of oil can earn for us abroad. Explore below the surface. Survey the land from the air. We must go on searching for many, many years. But who can guess what resources may still lie hidden there? But come down to earth again. For the land is where the great majority of our people earn their living. In farming, things have always been slow to change. Our methods are too often inefficient and thousands of acres of good farmland produce less than they should. Nothing short of a revolution in our thinking about agriculture will stop this continuing waste. But we've got to give the farmer the help he needs. In the long dry season, especially in the north, he's limited mostly to one harvest. We've got to spend at least 10 million pounds in this region alone to increase our water supplies. Irrigate the land. Use better seed and fertilizers. And where one crop grew before, we can sow two and reap twice the harvest. We are very much a nation of farmers. Always have been and always will be. The chances of increasing our wealth are bound up not only with the use we make of our land, but also with the people who buy what we produce. We can't afford to take them for granted. We've built up our trade over the years. We've got to make sure we keep it. We've been growing oil palms for a long time, but the wild palm groves are dying out and bearing smaller fruit. 
Barbarossa, we lose over half their valuable palm oil by using out-of-date hand presses. If we replant on a large scale and turn over to the highly efficient hydraulic presses, we shall go a long way towards solving this problem. England's the only producers of palm oil, we compete in an increasingly tough market. As cocoa farmers, we are pretty used to the ups and downs of market prices. We can ensure the farmer to some extent against this kind of insecurity. But there is also the risk of losing valuable harvests to insect pests and diseases. We must wage a quiet but relentless war against them. We need to grow more. But we must also look for ways of improving the quality of what we produce. We've started many new rubber plantations in the East and West, though it will be several years before they are mature enough for tapping. There's a science in producing high-quality rubber. It's like any kind of industry. We can't hope to increase our agricultural productivity until our farmers have become businessmen. Improve quality. Prevent waste. Organize the means of production. And even then, we still have to contend with the fact that our markets change. People become more choosy. In the timber trade, our customers are very particular about the wood they buy. It's our job to see they get the best for their purposes. furniture making. Plywood is the thing people want now. And a fly mill in the heart of the forest area of the Midwest is the logical answer. It makes the most of our chances. This is both good business and sound economics. But you've got to look at things from all angles. Transportation, power supplies, roads, harbors, and markets. Planning any development is a matter of opening the right door at the right time. Take a look at the prospects for just one of our largest resources. We could have a cattle industry in this country second to none. There's a thriving market for meat already. But we could go further and produce all the milk and butter, meat extracts, bone meal and manure that we need ourselves. We could start new leather industries and export our surplus to neighboring countries. We've been slow to get started, for the obstacles are prodigious. In the first place, we cannot yet guarantee life to our cattle. Of all the diseases, the most urgent to arrest is sleeping sickness. You have to break the chain of infection between animal and the carrier of the disease. It sits a fly. You can try to burn out its breeding grounds or spray chemicals over hundreds of square miles. But the surest way of protecting cattle is to inoculate them. It's an enormous job and will take time and persistence. Though once you've done it and can keep the major diseases under control, 
You can start. But the snack about any kind of development is that as soon as you open one door to improvement, you find another closed against you. In the dry season, our cattle have always had to make the long trek southward to find water and fresh pasture. Good beef goes to waste. So we shall have to provide both water and grazing. Put the cattle into reservations, set up ranches and mixed farms where they can grow fat and be looked after. We have the resource, but again we need money. We need equipment, we need experts, and we need to train our own people in the business of cattle management. With the help of these, the economists can fit the pieces of a plan together. Where to supply water, where to concentrate the ranches and farms, where are the best places for new abattoirs, which industries are the most important to set up first. It's not going to be easy. Development means strain and dislocation. It means changing our attitudes of mind, our ways of work, and the places we live in. All this won't come about in a day. But we don't have to be pushed if we know where we're going. What the planet tries to do is direct the framework of opportunity and show us where we can go. An essential part of this framework is an efficient system of communication. Ours is inadequate. We've got to put aside 70 million for building more railways and roads and improving transport services. We have all the power resources we could want in our coal, rivers, natural gas, and oil. But we've still got to harness them. By the end of the century, we shall be using five times our present output of electricity. In the next six years alone, we shall have to spend 30 million pounds on telecommunications. More still on housing, hospitals, and education another 30 million on our harbors and airport extensions. Development is an expensive business and we are in a hurry. Right now, we need all the investment power we can master to get off the ground. Think of our economy as a giant airliner setting out for its far destination with a heavy load of passengers and cargo. At first, it moves slowly as it taxes off towards the runway. But to lift the aircraft off the ground, it needs a massive boost of power from its engines. This is what the economist means when he talks of the process of economic takeoff. Once it's airborne, an economy becomes self-supporting. For us, however, the moment of takeoff is still a far away dream. From all regions of Nigeria, economists and planners meet to thrash out the problems of development. To plan wisely, they have to avoid a multitude of pitfalls, inflation, balance of payment crisis, grandiose projects, the dangers of wanting to spend more than we earn. Economists talk in terms of recurrent expenditure, foreign exchange, capital formation, trade gaps, in short, of money. How much do we need? 
Where is it going to come from? Through the ports of Lagos, Port Harcourt, Lori, South Korea and Calabar, Nigeria is linked to the rest of the world by her trade. There are many things we haven't got and can't do without. We have to come from overseas. And we pay for it all by sending back our own raw materials. labor for the things we want and which help us to produce more. Equipment and machinery, tools and transport, teachers and technicians. Of our total agricultural produce, more than half is exported abroad. In the past, we've done well from selling our cocoa and cotton, our benzene, the palm oil, timber and groundnuts. But we can't be certain that prices won't drop. There are no shortcuts in agriculture, yet we have to aim at a rapid increase in our export earnings. With minerals, it's easier if the markets can be found to take them. But we can also use our raw materials to save money as well as earn it. We have tin ore. And already we smelt all of it ourselves. From our scrap metal we make steel rod. And we use our limestone to make our own cement. Industries like these are a good beginning. They save our earnings for other purposes. But our urge to progress is forcing the pace. We don't yet progress enough skill and capital to do all we want to do quickly enough. So we invite foreign investors. We make this and all the other help we can get. But to attract money, we have to show that we can earn money. governments may govern, and economists plan, it comes down to this, the readiness of the ordinary man to respond to opportunity. In no more than a generation, we could, if things go well, become the workshop of West Africa. We used to think that the struggle for independence was everything. Now we have a much longer struggle ahead of us to fight for what freedom is really for. It's going to be hard and tough. The gap between ideas and reality is a big one. We shall have to put off many of the pleasures of today 
that we are to enjoy the rewards of tomorrow. When we shall be able to say to our children, we made this, and it's good. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.